I want to discuss the ongoing genocide in Palestine, but I, I, I think since you have been speaking so much, it's uh, it's worth taking a step step back and start with your analogy of the slave rebellion of 1831 and uh, what happened on October 7, because I thought that was one of your most remarkable intervention into the public debate about how to interpret the events on October 7. So can you just lay out your central thesis uh, as a preface to a broader discussion? Uh, there were two aspects to what happened on October 7. There was the factual aspect, which still remains kind of, it still remains murky. There can't be any doubt, I think, that uh, Hamas committed significant atrocities on October 7th, but doubts still remain, or let's just say it still remains murky, uh, the magnitude of the atrocities that occurred, the motives of Hamas as an organization, the extent to which some of the atrocities were personal initiatives, acts of vengeance, acts of revenge, and the extent to which the atrocities were part of the operational orders, um, the extent to which the Israeli military response was uh, accountable for a portion of the atrocities. And then there were specific allegations made pertaining to beheadings of babies, which Israel seems to have dropped, judging by its statements before the International Court of Justice. And then there was the separate issue of the uh, sexual violence in particular, the alleged rapes that occurred. There, I think, uh, no significant evidence has been put forth that the rapes that occurred, assuming rapes did occur, uh, the rapes were part of a systematic, methodical, uh, operational plan. Uh, so that's one broad category, namely the category of what happened, the factual side. As I already said, I think aspects of it, and I would say critical aspects of it, remain murky. That's not altogether unprecedented. You take the case of the Nazi Holocaust, which is probably the most documented atrocity uh, in academic scholarly life. Nonetheless, two fundamental questions remain unanswered. When did it begin? And why did Hitler, well, it's not, we don't even know if Hitler gave an order. There's still speculation that there was an order, but it's not been revealed. But why? when the decision was made and why the decision was made, now, that's perfectly it's perfectly obvious those are critical questions, the when and the why. You learn at a very young age, in grade school, I learned it, that the critical questions in journalism always are who, what, when, where, how, and why. I remember learning that in library class. It must have been sixth grade. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? And in the case of the Nazi Holocaust, even though it's the most documented, most exhaustively documented atrocity in academic and scholarly life, of those six questions, we do know the who, though aspects of the who are very unevenly documented, which is to say, the participants in the Nazi ho Holocaust in the various uh, satellite countries, the participants in uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and so forth, there's still, uh, there the scholarship is still very, very much at an early stage. So we know the who, 
though it's unevenly documented the who, we know the what, what happened, yeah, I think basically. We know the where, we don't know the when, we don't know the why, and the how is very unevenly documented because half of the how was not uh, death camps, it was just out in the field where Jews were shot to dead. So there's a certain amount of distortion as to the how. The normal assumption is the how was gas chambers and so forth, but that was actually about half the victims were in the gas chambers. And I would say on the how, uh, I don't want to, I, I, I have not studied the literature in the last 20 years. I stopped when I wrote this book on Daniel Goldhagen with Ruth Bettina Byrne. And uh, then I wrote The Holocaust Industry. And then I really stopped reading on it, which is already a quarter of a century ago. And there's been a voluminous literature, scholarly literature since then, mostly by Germans. Uh, German young scholars, young German scholars. I would say, if you look carefully at the literature I read up until 25 years ago, the the actual scholarship on the gas chambers has been was quite sparse. The actual scholarship was quite sparse, uh, which enabled. Holocaust deniers, revisionists, to make sorts of claims which weren't easily answerable. There were all sorts of claims about how could you have killed and disposed of so many bodies and so forth. In any event, so to return to your question, and this was a long digression, to return to your question, the factual side is murky but we know enough to know Hamas committed serious uh, uh, crimes, serious atrocities. So that part, I think we can take as a given serious atrocities occur. But then the second question is, how do we morally evaluate them? What happened? And once atrocities occur, then you have to say, well, the normal legal standards, the laws of war apply, which is to say, if they constituted war crimes or at a higher level crimes against humanity, or even at a higher level, what's called acts of genocide. Uh, it can't seriously, in my opinion, be called a genocide. However, there may be an argument I'm not refined enough to make these kinds of uh, discriminations. Maybe it constitutes an act of genocide, um, but that's still a legal category. And I have said, and I said it when I was asked by Pierce Morgan, that legally they have to be held culpable, held culpable for those crimes although were I their attorneys and I'm not averse to playing that role, I would certainly believe that uh, clemency is warranted in the case of young men who were born into a concentration camp. Um, but that still didn't leave them, leave open, didn't still answer the moral question which is you can acknowledge atrocities occur, but then what moral judgment do you pass on these young men who were born into a concentration camp and uh, committed these atrocities? Uh, and I struggled with that question because part of me, probably because I was too close to the material, or I was close enough to mater the material. Uh, I had spent 15 years 
just going through these human rights reports on the various atrocities that Israel had inflicted on the people of Gaza. Uh, the daily atrocities of this blockade, which Richard Goldstone in the Goldstone report said incredibly rose to the level of a crime against humanity. The daily reality of that criminal blockade of Gaza. And then that criminal blockade was periodically punctuated by these high-tech massacres, what Israel called operations in Gaza. Having been close to that material, I found it very hard in me to condemn the perpetrators of those atrocities. And I then tried to figure out what was the closest situation analogous enough that I can see how it's been reasoned in the past. And the closest I could get was the slave uprisings, the slave revolts in American history. And once I felt confident that that was a reasonable analogy, my next step was to see how the abolitionists, those who fought against uh, slavery, how did they react to the slave revolts? And it came as a kind of relief to me, a moral sucker for me, that the, the most famous of the abolitionists at that time, well, there were several, but certainly one of the uh, most famous, uh, there was uh, Charles Sumner, there was Wendell Phillips, uh, and there was William Lloyd Garrison, there were others I'm leaving now. Uh, the most, one of the best known, William Lloyd Garrison, he was the editor of a newspaper called The Liberator, and it was very clear from his commentary after Nat Turner's rebellion that although he recognized atrocities had occurred and horrors had unfolded, which they did, there's no question about that. Unlike in the case of Gaza, Nat Turner's uh, re rebels, they did behead babies. There's no question about that. And they smashed skulls. Uh, and they committed disembowelings. It was a very ugly uh, turn of events. And that Turner's order to his rebel crowd was kill all whites. That was very simple and straightforward. Uh, but notwithstanding that, basically William Lloyd Garrison's position was, we told you so. He directed his ire, not at the perpetrators of the rebellion, but at those who passively or actively participate in the system that dehumanized an entire group of people. And Garrison said, we told you so. If you treat people this way, uh, you will reap what you have sown. And he never once, although he acknowledged atrocities occurred and horrors had occurred, if you read carefully his statement, he never once actually and directly condemned Nat Turner. And that was true in his private correspondence as well. Uh, I've read his correspondence on the question, and he was, uh, he said, you know, I'm a pacifist. He was a pacifist. And they believed in the pacifists, the abolitionist pacifists, they believed in what they called moral suasion, that is to try to persuade the country that what they were doing was wrong. But he said, if anybody had 
a just grounds for using violence, he said, well, personally, I oppose it. But if anybody had a just grounds for using violence, he said it was the slaves. And I do believe if anybody had a just right to use violence, it was the uh, those young men who were born into a concentration camp. Where every other every other option, every other option had been extinguished. The Hamas did communicate. It was ready for a settlement along the lines of the international consensus for resolving the conflict. They issued many statements along those lines. There were problems there. I'm not going to deny it because they were insistent on full implementation of a right of return uh, of the Palestinian refugees. And that is a problem in my opinion as a practical matter, but there was never any attempt to negotiate. They were simply dismissed out of hand. They then tried nonviolence in March 2018, the Great March of Return. And all they got for it was a couple of hundred Palestinians killed, and several tens of thousands of them were injured, and not an insignificant number were injured. Um, with life-changing injuries as the Israeli snipers targeted the kneecap and below of the nonviolent protesters, and even not protesters, people who were 300, 300 meters from the border and who were just leaning against trees. Uh, so, Tens of thousands of injured, including a significant number with or willful, purposeful, life-changing injuries. And then, so diplomacy was a dead end. A diplomatic settlement was a dead end. Nonviolence was a dead end. And by the time of October 6th, uh, it, to the extent that the conflict was, or the region was still in the news, it was with the expectation that Saudi Arabia would uh, sign an agreement with the U.S. and Israel, and the conflict, the, the, the Middle East conflict would be resolved over the heads of the Palestinians. And so the fate for the Palestinians in Gaza was to be confined, immured in a concentration camp, left there to languish and die. I do not believe that's in any way an exaggeration of where matters stood on October 6th. So I am very averse, reluctant, to condemn what happened on October 7th. Uh, atrocities are appalling for sure, but being born into and having no prospect whatever except to languish and die in a concentration camp is also appalling. One of the things that I found in your article about uh, or, or column about the Net Turner Rebellion was religion itself. Uh, you wrote that Net Turner was incredibly steeped in religion, and attempts were made at the time to say that what he or they did was because of religious fanaticism. And this was not limited to Net Turner Rebellion, the White Lotus Rebellion in China in the 1790s, the great upsurge in India in the revolt of 1857. All of them had deep political and economic underpinnings behind and immediately the counter reactionary forces, sometimes it's the Qing state, sometimes it's the British state, would, would label the rebels as driven by some fanaticism and religion. And I wanted to bring this up because you also went on to then attack or criticize 
to euphemize uh, Sam Harris and uh, and show how his language and what he advocates is very similar to the Nazis. So if you can spell that out a little bit for us. Well, uh, in the list you went through of uh, rebellions that had a religious, uh, a religious, uh, it's not so much content. They, they, were, they used a religious idiom. It's also true of the Boxer Rebellion um, in China. The simple fact of the matter is different people use different languages in order to express their uh, discontents. And usually they use a language which is easily available to them. So African Americans who didn't go to school, who were overwhelmingly illiterate, they did have a rich church tradition. And Nat Turner in particular was by all accounts, he was hyper literate. It was said that everyone, white and black, everyone, black and white, uh, paid deference to his intellect. Uh, but it was also true that he was universally dismissed subsequently after the rebellion as a religious fanatic and a religious, a religious, uh, insane, insane. He was insane in his religious, in his religiosity. And one of the comments about that dismissal of him as being religiously, in, a religious fanatic one of the comments was that the South had to believe that because otherwise they would have to confront the injustice or the nature of the injustice that spurred Nat Turner on, the impetus behind his rebellion and they didn't want to have to deal with that. Just on the question of Nat Turner again, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I mentioned uh, William Lloyd Garrison's private correspondence on the Nat Turner Rebellion. And one sentence which I appreciated was, he said, quote, I do not justify the slaves in their rebellion, yet I do not condemn them. And I think that's the proper formulation. You don't justify what happened, but you also don't condemn them. So that, as I said, resonated for me. The other thing which I think is worth bearing in mind is even as I described this, um, even as I described a rather grisly rebellion that was conducted by Mr. Turner and his Confederates, the historical verdict is not what one would expect, namely, now Turner occupies now an honored place in American history. So you will know the American historian, Eric Foner, probably the most authoritative, one, if not the most authoritative uh, scholars on slavery and the Civil War and then Reconstruction. Already way back in 1971, long before political correctness and then identity politics was the vogue, already back then he edited a volume. It was called Nat Turner. And the series for this volume, I'm holding it up now for your uh, audience, 
was titled Great Lives Observed. Now you must appreciate the irony of that. Matt Turner gave the order to kill all whites, beheaded babies, disemboweled others, smashed skulls, and now he is in a series called Great Lives Observed. And somebody emailed me an article. It was about this famous controversy surrounding a fictionalized account of Matt Turner's rebellion by a person named William Styron. And one of the great historians on slavery, Eugene Genovese, entered the debate. He's the author of the classic study, Roll, Jordan Roll. And he was what you might call a cantankerous leftist who eventually became quite far to the right, I would say. And he said in one of his articles I was reading, and now I'm quoting him, he said, Nat Turner led a slave revolt under extremely difficult circumstances and deserves an honored place in our history. Well, it does cause you or cause one to wonder, assuming humanity survives another 50 or so years, which is a question mark, but assuming it does, what the verdict will be on October 7th. Hi, my name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider donating for the cause. Link is in the description below. Also, if you are not able to do so, don't feel sad. You can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades. Finally, don't forget to hit the subscribe button.